Hello again, it's Mrs Top here. I've just been out doing some weeding in the garden. My vegetable patch is coming on well now in this warmer weather. I hope yours is too. Now, I've been asked to come back to answer some questions because children have been sending them in for me. So I've picked five of them and I'll do my best to answer. The first one is from Harry. How would you know if there was a gas bomb? Well, Harry, I would have hoped you might have had some practice on this, some drills perhaps at school. But anyway, just in case you missed that and you aren't aware, what you need to do is listen out for the sound of the gas rattle. I have one here because I've borrowed it from my brother George, who is the air raid warden. So you listen out for the sound of the rattle. And if you hear that, you know that you need to put your mask on immediately. So, chin in first, over the head with the straps. Makes your voice sound a bit muffled, doesn't it? And it might start to steam up inside after a while, but it's all for the best. And then we keep that on until we hear the all clear for a gas attack, which is the sound of a handbell. So our next question is from Mia. What happens to pets in an air raid? Excellent question, Mia. I'm an animal lover myself, as you may know. You might have seen my cat sneaking into the background of some of my films before. So, pets. Well, I'm glad that I was able to bring mine here with me when we evacuated from Coventry. Only possible, really, because we had a private evacuation to my brother's house. But I think they would have been very scared if they'd had to stay behind in some of the big blitz that they had in Coventry. If you're out and about in an air raid, then pets aren't allowed into the shelter, unfortunately, in public. Public shelters are for large groups of people, up to 50 people, but if you're taking your dog for a walk, you would have to leave your dog tied up outside. What you do in your own shelter at home is another matter. If you wish to take your dog into your Anderson shelter in the garden, that's quite up to you. Bear in mind, though, that you may be in there for some hours. For the humans, you'll probably have a bucket for the necessary duties, uh, but for dogs, they cats, if they need the toilet, it's a different matter. Our next question is from Archie. We saw a photograph of a policeman with a metal helmet on. Is that to protect him from bombs? Well, Archie, those helmets are made of steel. I have one here. This is actually my brother's helmet. My brother is an air raid warden. So this is what he wears to protect his head when he's on duty sometimes. You can see it has a letter W on the front so that he can be spotted in case anyone needs his help. And in fact, another W on the back so you can recognise him from behind too. So the steel helmet is not actually to protect from bombs. If I put it on my head now, if we were fortunate enough to have a direct hit on our house here, it wouldn't protect me, it wouldn't save my life in those circumstances if a bomb landed right on my head. But what it would do, hopefully, is protect me from any debris, from bits of bricks and rubble flying around and landing on my head. And that's very important for wardens because they may have to be going in along with other civil defence workers to try to rescue people from damaged buildings. They could collapse all around them at any moment. So that's where they wear the steel helmet. It has a chin strap that would keep it fastened under your chin and the inside is lined with leather to give it a snug fit on your head. Question four is from Charlie. Can I take my phone with me if I get evacuated? Phone, Charlie? Is this what you mean? Well, if your family are lucky enough to have a telephone, I don't think they'd be very pleased if you tried to take it with you when you're evacuated. In any case, you will have hardly any space for luggage. You're only supposed to take a very small case, something like this one here. I don't think you could fit a telephone and all the wiring and so on in here. And even if you did, it's very unlikely that the family that you stay with when you're billeted will have a connection to the telephone exchange. No, no, you'll be given a postcard when you arrive to write, to send to your family to let them know you've arrived safely. And that will do quite nicely, thank you. Now our final question is from Ruby. What if you don't like the food? No then Ruby, it does sound to me as though you might be one of those fussy children. And I'm afraid really there is no room for fussiness in wartime. Food is rationed, or at least many foods are. We have to have our book before we're allowed to buy them. And so it's really rather difficult for your parents or the people looking after you if you won't eat what's put in front of you. 
Having said that, my own children are not too keen on some of the recipes from the latest book that I've acquired. I thought this was going to be very useful. It's called What to Give Them. But strangely, they're not too keen on some of the suggestions. These particular dishes are made from meats that are unrationed, although perhaps that is a reason why they're less popular. We shall see. So, for example, we have pig's trotters and dumplings, a liver sandwich, rabbit pie, uh, sheep's heart pie, ooh, or cow heel stew, or perhaps a lovely sheep's head broth. As I say, my own children aren't too convinced about those. I think really the secret here is to make the best of something that you already have if there's an ingredient that you can adapt to make something you are more familiar with. And our secret weapon here is Dr. Carrot. Now, just as the soil is starting to warm up now as we're moving into April, is actually the perfect time to get your carrot seeds planted out in the garden. And if you manage to escape the dreaded root fly, hopefully you will have a good crop from those. Because carrots have a natural sweetness, so they're excellent as a substitute for sugar in recipes and for making all kinds of sweets. So you can make a carrot lollipop. Mm, quite tasty. You can make carrot fudge. And there's a wonderful recipe from Marguerite Patton for carrot cookies. Now, Miss Patton suggests a brisk oven. I would say maybe that's about gas mark six. And Ruby, you might like to add a little pinch of spice if you have some in the cupboard at home. So here's a little film. I'll leave you with that and give it a go. Toodle pip. <laughs>